Welcome to another CCRN review video. This one focuses on the GI review, and let's get started. The GI portion of the CCRN test has a few testable categories, ranging from acute GI bleed to pancreatitis. Starting with some gastrointestinal structures, we have the mouth, esophagus, stomach, the small intestine, large intestine, the pancreas, the gallbladder, and the liver and spleen. Just some abdominal anatomy overview. Within the right upper quadrant, we have the liver, the right kidney, the right adrenal gland, the duodenum, and the head of the pancreas. Within the right lower quadrant, we have the appendix, cecum, the right ureter, the right ovary and fallopian tube for the females, and the right spermatic cord for the males. Within the left upper quadrant, we have the spleen, stomach, the left kidney and adrenal gland, and the body of the pancreas. And within the left lower quadrant, we have the sigmoid colon, the left ureter, the left ovary and fallopian tube, and the left spermatic cord. Starting with abdominal trauma, there are some common clinical signs. Starting with Kerr's sign, this is referred pain to the left shoulder due to diaphragmatic irritation, which is common in a ruptured spleen. Also with a splenic injury, that can be ecchymosis or, or bruising within the left upper quadrant. The next sign is Gray Turner's sign, and this is bruising within the flank, common in retroperitoneal bleeding. The next sign is Cullen's sign, and this is ecchymosis or bruising around the umbilicus, which is very common in intraperitoneal bleeding and also pancreatic issues, such as hemorrhagic pancreatitis. Also, when you hear bowel sounds in the chest, you can consider diaphragm rupture. When you see free air on the abdominal x ray, typically think of GI perforation. When you get positive blood from a peritoneal lavage, you can think intra-abdominal bleeding. Moving on to the next slide. So one of the things that can develop that can be an emergency is the abdominal compartment syndrome. Common causes of ACS is trauma, such as a gunshot wound, emergent abdominal surgery, and massive fluid resuscitation. Anytime you have increased intra-abdominal pressure, this can result in reduced cardiac output, increased systemic vascular resistance, decreased perfusion to the kidneys, and reduced venous return due to the pressure being greater than that of the capillaries within the abdomen, which causes ischemia and subsequent infarction of the organs. It's important to note that this can occur without abdominal distension. What do we call increased pressures within the abdominal cavity? Intra-abdominal hypertension. This develops when there's an intra-abdominal pressure, an IAP, of greater than 12 millimeters of mercury. The normal abdominal perfusion pressure is measured by taking your mean arterial pressure and subtracting the intra-abdominal pressure to get your abdominal perfusion pressure. APPs of greater than 60 can have an increased risk of survival for the patient. APPs of 50 or less can have an increased risk of mortality. So the less perfusion pressure in the abdominal cavity, the higher the risk of mortality. Abdominal compartment syndrome begins at a sustained IAP of 20 millimeters of mercury. And this is associated with new organ dysfunction or failure. So how do we measure the pressures within the abdomen? Well, we're going to assess the patient and the pressures by measuring the bladder pressure. The normal bladder pressure is 0 to 5 millimeters of mercury. We measure the bladder pressure because it's closely related to the intraperitoneal pressure. When measuring the bladder pressure, we want to keep the transducer at the level of the symphysis pubis. Again, it's important to note that an IAP greater than 12, which is intra-abdominal hypertension, can begin with physiological compromise to the patient, and a decompression laparotomy should be considered with an IAP of greater than 20. Greater than 20 IAP can be fatal. Again, this is when you're getting up into the abdominal compartment syndrome. So how do you prevent abdominal compartment syndrome or at least reducing your intra-abdominal pressures? So you want to maintain the head of bed 20 degrees or less while sometimes placing the patient in reverse Trendelenburg. You want to manage their pain and any agitation. You want to loosen all constrictive clothing. You want to prevent fluid overload and subsequent hypervolemia or any overhydration. You can also place an NG tube to low intermittent suction to help decompress the abdomen. And also you can assess for impaction and treat the patient while optimizing the stool management. It's moving on to bowel infarction. This is when you have a reduced blood flow to the mesenteric vessels or arteries, 
with prolonged ischemia, which causes edema of the intestinal walls, leading to necrosis and subsequent perforation. Common causes of bowel infarction include arteriosclerosis, surgery, thrombus, hypercoagulability states, intra-abdominal infection, and the use of vasopressors. Some of the things to look for with a bowel infarction presentation is abdominal distension and vomiting, severe abdominal pain and cramping, hypoactive or absent bowel sounds, fever, tachycardia, and hypotension. When you're treating bowel infarction, you want to start with the emergency things first, such as your airway, your breathing, and your circulation. Things that will also help bowel infarction treatment, or at least the management of, is gastric decompression via an NG tube, placing the patient NPO, and administering IV fluids. When you have a bowel infarction, surgery is going to be required to have a bowel resection, which removes the necrotic tissue. You also want to monitor the patient for sepsis and treat the patient's pain. Moving on to bowel obstruction, there are three common types of bowel obstruction. You have your paralytic ileus, and a small bowel obstruction, and a large bowel obstruction. Your paralytic ileus is common from abdominal surgery, hypokalemia, peritonitis, intestinal distension, opioid use, and sepsis. Typically, the paralytic ileus is usually transient and is typically less severe than a small bowel obstruction. Moving on to the small bowel obstructions, these are common from adhesions within the abdominal cavity, hernia, volvulus, and a neoplasm, and it could be partial or complete, can be described as simple or strangulated. Moving on to the large bowel obstruction, this is commonly from neoplasms, diverticulitis, strictures, fecal impaction, and barium impaction. Some of the things to be concerned about during the bowel obstruction presentation is when they're vomiting and how much abdominal distension they have. So in the small bowel obstruction, you have your vomiting early, and you also have a small amount of abdominal distension. This is because the obstruction is more proximal, which leaves less bowel for the GI contents to back up in, thus you have your vomiting early. Hypokalemia could also be present, and typically the pain is sharp and episodic. You also are going to have more commonly high-pitched bowel sounds, and the KUB is going to show dilated loops of gas-filled bowel. Moving on to the large bowel, you're going to have vomiting late. You're also going to have a larger amount of abdominal distension. This is because the blockage is more distal than the small bowel, leaving more gut to distend. You're also going to see a change in bowel habits prior to the large bowel obstruction, or during. And you're going to end up auscultating low-pitched bowel sounds instead of high-pitched bowel sounds. And the KUB, again, is going to show dilated loops of gas-filled bowel. So same with your bowel infarction treatment. Your bowel obstruction treatment is going to begin with your ABCs, placing the patient in PO and administering IV fluids. There is one exception. During a bowel obstruction, if it's very proximal, you can end up using the enteral feedings through like a J-tube. If that J-tube is distal to the obstruction, you can still use the rest of the bowel that's not obstructed. You want to place your patient with an NG tube to low intermittent suction to help decompress and reduce the risk of perforation. And you want to monitor your patient for signs of infection, sepsis, and peritonitis. You're also going to want to manage their pain. Only surgery is indicated for complete obstructions, strangulations, and bowel perforations. This leads us on to bowel perforations. This is the leak of GI contents into the peritoneal cavity causing infection and inflammation. So not only do you have bacteria within the GI contents, your GI contents is usually more acidic, so you're going to have infection from the bacteria and inflammation from the infection and the acidity of the bowel contents into the abdomen. Common causes of bowel perforation is appendicitis, penetrating wound, a bowel obstruction, peptic ulcers, and ulcerative colitis. The bowel perforation treatment is very similar to the bowel infarction and the bowel obstruction. You're going to place the patient in PO, you're going to give them IV fluids, and you're in addition to that, you're going to give them antibiotics and possibly draw some blood cultures as the chances of infection are very high. Surgery is indicated for repair of the perforation with an antibiotic lavage during surgery. You also want to treat the patient's pain level. Moving on to the liver and liver failure. Of course, we know that the liver has dozens of functions, but some of the important ones here are detoxification, vitamin and mineral storage. It's a huge metabolic factory and waste disposal organ. It produces bile salts, 
and metabolizes carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Also, it produces clotting factors. It also metabolizes bilirubin, and it is a large blood reservoir. Some of the things we're going to be looking at for the liver assessment is your protein level, your albumin levels, your prealbumin, bilirubin, ammonia, your coagulation studies, and your liver enzyme lab tests. So liver failure, there's acute and chronic. Acute liver failure is more commonly caused by acetaminophen overdose, which is Tylenol. And your chronic liver failure, its most common cause is alcohol abuse. Some important information to know about liver failure. In the acute liver failure and inflammatory state, you're going to have enlargement of the liver, which can be felt by palpation. If you go to palpate the liver and you cannot palpate it, this is going to be an indication of a late or chronic state of liver failure. And that's because the liver decreases in size. So the typical liver failure presentation includes being jaundice due to the elevated bilirubin and your liver not being able to metabolize the bilirubin anymore. You're going to end up with altered mental status in your patient due to the elevated ammonia levels, which is called hepatic encephalopathy. You're going to have your patients often with a hand tremor, which is also due to the elevated ammonia. The patient also may have some ascites due to low protein and albumin, which decreases their oncotic pressure and increases the risk of peritonitis. In the later stages of liver failure, you can have a patient that goes into hepatorenal syndrome, which is renal failure development in the setting of liver failure. And this has a really high mortality rate, which is approximately 80% of the people that develop hepatorenal syndrome. Sepsis is a very common presentation of liver failure. And this is due to bacterial, of course, or can be fungal in nature, and this is due to the reduced immune function. So in liver failure, you can have some alterations in your lab presentations. Increased ammonia, we've already discussed. Again, decreased serum albumin and protein, which leads to ascites. You can end up with pancytopenia, which is decreased white blood cell count, red blood cell count, and your platelets. The patient can have some coagulopathies, which is increased PT and increased PTT levels and due to also being decreased with your fibrinogen levels. You can have an increase in your liver enzymes, which is the AST, ALT, your alkaline phosphatase, and your GGT. You can have an increase in your serum bilirubin, again, due to the liver's inability to metabolize the bilirubin as well. You can also have a decrease in serum glucose and respiratory alkalosis, which ends up leading to metabolic acidosis. Late-stage liver failure it shows an increased serum creatinine and BUN. Again, that's hepatorenal syndrome. Hepatic encephalopathy stages. This is, again, due to the high ammonia level. You can have stage 1, which your patient is going to be forgetful, have a change in sleep patterns, is very mildly confused, and, and experiences some irritability. Stage 2 of hepatic encephalopathy. The patient's going to have increased confusion, a little bit of lethargy, apathy, Asterixis, which is your hand tremor, and your atypical or aberrant behavior. It's important to note that stage 1 and stage 2 of your liver failure, hepatic encephalopathy stages, the patient's brain waves, or the EEG, is going to be normal. Stage 3, the patient becomes severely confused, hyperactive, deep tendon reflexes are also present, and is going to be more lethargic to stuporous. Hyperventilation is common, and this is going to have a presentation of an abnormal EEG. The patient's brain waves are going to begin to change. Stage 4 is your last stage, and this is going to be posturing within the patient, positive Babinski reflex, and no response to stimuli. Again, the EEG being abnormal. So what do you do to reduce the risk of hepatic encephalopathy? You want to reduce the ammonia levels and remove factors that increase the ammonia levels. So conditions that increase the ammonia levels, there should be avoided. So conditions that you should avoid are an increased BUN level. This is saying that there's a lot of breakdown of nitrogen, which turns into ammonia. Again, with a protein, a breakdown of nitrogen, which is going to turn into ammonia. Often patients in severe liver failure have GI bleeds, and this is going to increase their risk for hepatic encephalopathy. This is because GI bleeds from the metabolism of the protein in the blood, again, is going to break down its nitrogen and turn into ammonia. Later stages include lactic acidosis, and this can occur if the patient in liver failure receives lactated ringers. A lot of times when patients go to surgery, they get lactated ringers, so we want to avoid that in liver failure patients. The unhealthy liver is unable to convert that lactate into bicarb, therefore increasing the lactate level. 
So management of liver failure specifically, you want to administer acetylcysteine, which is mucamist, for any suspected acetaminophen overdose. You want to monitor their neurostatus and glucose level, and you're going to give the patient lactulose for an increased ammonia level. You may also need to administer to the patient clotting factors, again, due to their increased risk of bleeding. You can also give neomycin or zefaxin, which helps kill gut bacteria responsible for producing ammonia. There's one side effect to this that's very important. This also kills the gut bacteria responsible for making vitamin K. So the patient can end up with a vitamin K deficiency when you're given neomycin or zefaxin, which again is going to increase their risk of bleeding. You also want to adjust medications that are metabolized by the liver and decrease their dose or extend out how often you give them. Patients who are severely uncomfortable can have some palliative surgery done to help relieve some of the pressure on their esophageal varices or ascites, and this is the TIPS procedure, which stands for Transjugular Intrahepatic Portosystemic Shunt. This is one of the procedures you have to weigh the risks versus benefits because there is some adverse effects to the TIPS procedure. You're going to be relieving pressure on the esophageal varices and ascites. You do that by diverting blood away from the liver and the hepatic veins. So this can increase your risk of hepatic encephalopathy because your liver is filtering less blood, which contains ammonia. So the patients that are receiving this surgery, this TIPS procedure, they need essentially the smallest stent size they can handle to reduce the risk of an hepatic encephalopathy. That way you can still relieve pressure on their esophageal varices and still be able to medically manage their hepatic encephalopathy with neomycin, zefaxin, or lactulose. This leads us into GI bleeding. There's two locations to think of with GI bleeds. It's upper GI and lower GI. An upper GI bleed has an increased risk of mortality, and 50% of GI bleeds are from peptic ulcers. Lower GI bleeds are about 20% of acute bleeds, so they're not quite as serious as the upper GI bleeds. And the common location of a GI bleed in the setting of liver failure is, we've already mentioned that, is esophageal varices, and this is often due to portal vein hypertension as normal drainage through the liver is impeded. The typical venous drainage of the GI system starts with a portal vein, which goes through the liver, to the hepatic vein, and then to the inferior vena cava. So when your liver is cirrhosed or scarred, the blood filtering slows down, which increases the pressure in the portal vein. So anything that's connected to the portal vein is going to receive a lot of that pressure. And your esophagus and your throat and your stomach are some of those that are connected to that portal vein. So some of the treatments for esophageal varices include banding or sclerosing of the varices through endoscopy procedures. So you can essentially strangulate some of the varices, they have fallen off, and you can sclerose them by scarring the tissue, making them thicker so they can hold a little more pressure before they start bleeding. In severe acute bleeds from esophageal bleedings, you can have a Synstock and Blakemore tube. This is a balloon to help tamponade the bleeding. This balloon is filled to a pressure of about 20 to 40 millimeters per mercury, depending on the amount of bleeding you need to control. In order to be able to do this, you have to empty the stomach by another catheter within that balloon to suction, and you have an increased risk of airway occlusion when this balloon becomes the place. So you need to have scissors at the bedside, and so you're able to cut that balloon in respiratory distress. Continuing on with upper GI bleeding, your management is addressing the cause. Again, I already mentioned the peptic ulcers are 50% of upper GI bleeds, but some of the other causes are esophageal varices, esophagitis, gastritis, or Mallory Weiss tear. Mallory Weiss tears are very uncommon, but this typically always in the setting of very severe or very forceful continuous vomiting that will typically tear your esophagus down distally towards the stomach, and that is the Mallory Weiss tear. You want to use isotonic fluids for hypovolemic shock, and if you have a GI bleed within the gastric antrum, you can use a gastric lavage, essentially within your stomach. You want to use room temperature water or iced water. Room temperature water is cold enough to constrict the blood vessels within the stomach, and which will help slow down the bleeding. You can also give blood products, such as packed red blood cells, fresh frozen plasma, and platelets. 
And you want to administer medications such as H2 blockers and PPIs that are going to help reduce that inflammation and that gastric irritation from your gastric secretions. You also can give medications such as vasopressin, which is going to decrease your portal venous pressure by constricting the splenic arterial bed. When you're given vasopressin, you want to monitor for chest pain and ST elevation because you're constricting those arteries. You also can give octreotide, which is also called sandostatin, and this is also going to reduce the pressure in the portal vein by reducing that splenic artery blood flow, and it also reduces your gastric acid secretions, kind of similar to the H2 and PPIs. You can also give osmotic laxative, such as sorbitol, to help remove the blood from the GI tract. You're only going to do this in, typically in the setting of severe liver failure because the blood in the GI tract gets digested, again turning that protein into nitrogen, which will convert into ammonia within the GI system. So it's important to always watch your ammonia levels when you have a GI bleed. You can also give beta blockers, which will help constrict the mesenteric arterioles. This will also reduce portal venous flow, helping to reduce that bleeding. Some lower GI bleeding common causes is, again, diverticulosis, tumor, radiation, colitis, and inflammatory conditions such as Crohn's disease infectious conditions such as Clostridium difficile, and already know that lower GI bleeding is associated with less mortality than the upper GI bleeding and also is less common, so there's lower chances of admission to the ICU with a lower GI bleed. That's it for the liver failure and GI bleeds. Let's move on to pancreatitis. Some of the functions of the pancreas include exocrine and endocrine functions. So your exocrine functions are the secretion of bicarbonate to neutralize stomach acid, and also secretes water, sodium, potassium, and digestive enzymes such as trypsin, which aids in your protein digestion, amylase, which aids in carbohydrate digestion, and lipase, which aids in fat digestion. So there's a bunch of hormones released from the exocrine functions of the pancreas. Note that factors that increase secretion of these hormones include parasympathetic stimulation and food. Some of the endocrine functions of the pancreas include having the alpha cells secrete glucagon, the beta cells secreting insulin, and your delta cells secreting somatostatin, which helps inhibit the effects of glucagon and insulin secretion. Acute pancreatitis is essentially diffuse inflammation due to autodigestion of the pancreas from premature activation of the exocrine enzymes. So there's two types of acute pancreatitis, and we'll get to those. There's edematous and hemorrhagic. Any type of pancreatitis is going to lead to a systemic inflammatory response, which causes increased vasodilation, vascular stasis, microthrombosis, and increased vascular permeability within that abdominal region there. Note that acute pancreatitis is not always caused by infection. So what are the common causes of pancreatitis? It's obstruction, most often due to gallstones, alcoholism, abdominal surgery, drugs, hyperlipidemia, which has to be severe. When you see your patient's triglycerides extremely elevated, 500 to 1,000, those patients are definitely at risk for acute pancreatitis. You can also have it from trauma and infection. So some of the signs and symptoms of pancreatitis include abdominal pain, which radiates to all quadrants, nausea, vomiting, and a rigid abdomen, decreased or absent bowel sounds, an increase in white blood cell count, your amylase, and your lipase levels. And it's important to note that lipase stays elevated longer than amylase, and amylase can be elevated up to about four days. There's also a decreased calcium level, which can exhibit Trousseau sign, which calcium is used in autodigestion of the pancreas, and pancreatitis can also increase your blood sugar. Some complications of a pancreatitis, in addition to the signs and symptoms, are left pleural effusion, atelectasis of your left lower lobe, which also lifts the diaphragm on the left side, bilateral crackles or rails or lung sounds, leading to ARDS and even death. These complications are caused from release of phospholipase A. When it gets into the bloodstream, it's going to destroy your type 2 alveolar cells responsible for releasing surfactant within the lungs. This will lead to the pulmonary complications listed above. Other than edematous pancreatitis, we have the hemorrhagic pancreatitis. Again, some of the signs and abdominal complications are your colon sign, which remember that's the ecchymosis around the umbilicus, and that is the picture on the top. You can also have your Gray-Turner sign, which is the ecchymosis in the flank, and that is the picture on the bottom. 
You can also have a patient that has darkened or severely unhealthy looking plasma, and that is from digested methylalbumin in the blood and colors the plasma to a darker brown. Normally, plasma in the blood is very light, light clear to a light brown when it's separated from your red blood cells. However, when this is separated from your red blood cells, the color of the plasma is very, very dark, almost tar looking. So severity of pancreatitis varies depending on the patient presentation. If your patient has one or more of these risk factors on admission, such as age being greater, greater than 55, an elevated white blood cell count over 16,000, an LDH, which is your lactic acid dehydrogenase level being over 350, an AST liver enzyme being greater than 250, and your glucose over 200, if your patient has one or more of these, that means the pancreatitis is more severe. Moving on, if your patient developed these in the next 48 hours, that means their pancreatitis is getting more severe, and that's listed here. Your BUN increases over 5. Your BUN increases more than 5 from admission. Your hematocrit decreases a greater than 12. And due to all the pancreatic fluid loss from autodigestion or hemorrhagic, if you have a patient that is fluid positive greater than 6 liters, that can be a very bad sign. Also, your calcium being lower than 8, and your PaO2 on your blood gas being lower than 60, and a base deficit on your blood gas of greater than 4. So the, the higher severity of pancreatitis is directly related to how many of these signs these patients have. There's not a lot of spleen questions on the CCRN. There is some spleen concepts to remember. Remember at the beginning of the video, we have the signs of splenic rupture, which is the curse sign, which is your deferred sharp left shoulder pain, and ecchymosis over the left upper quadrant. You can also have abdominal distension with absent bowel sounds. Just know that a patient with a history of a splenectomy will typically cause the patient to have a reduced immune function. Here's some differentiation of the abdominal pain, and this is a quick reference guide you can download on lifelongnursing.com. I'll put a link to the description in the YouTube video below. But how you see this is, this, say for the third column, peptic ulcer, the location of your pain is going to be epigastric or right of epigastric. Your quality of pain is going to be burning or gnawing. Your associated symptoms with peptic ulcer include abdominal tenderness, hemoptysis, and melana, which is your dark brown bloody stools. So if you want to look at this, pause the video or download the link in the description below or again, go to lifelongnursing.com. I won't go over these entirely in the video. There's a few nutritional questions on the GI portion of the CCRN exam. Just know that enteral feeding is always preferred over parental feeding. So feeding through the gut is always preferred over the IV feeding, such as TPN. And feeding should always be monitored very closely and advance to goal rates within 24 to 48 hours if you are able, if the patient is tolerating the feeding. Hemodynamically unstable patients should not be giving enteral nutrition. Enteral nutrition also helps to maintain gut structure and function and is less costly and less risk of complications than parenteral feeding. During enteral nutrition therapy, you must maintain the patient's head of bed greater than 30 degrees, and you must ensure proper placement of the catheters before you initiate feeding, and you don't necessarily have to check gastric residuals as often as you used to due to benefits versus risks of malnutrition. So, for example, if you check the patient's residual and it's 250, you want to put that back and restart the feeding. The next time you check the patient's residual and it's 250, then you want to you want to put that back and restart the feeding and think about gastric motility agents such as Reglan to help the patient's residuals. Anytime you get a gastric residual over 500, you want to put that back and postpone the feeding for about an hour and let the physician know. And know that parental feeding does not enhance anabolism of proteins. So that's it, guys. Thank you for watching. Please visit lifelongnursing.com for more information. Please be sure to watch the gastrointestinal practice question videos after this video. Also, please make sure to press that subscribe button to keep getting updates on great content from Lifelong Nursing. Remember, learn everything.